we had a family farm. It was about 15 minutes away from our house, uh, a lot of acreage. So we'd always, I was in the woods a lot, um, just always outside running around, causing trouble, um, hunting, just gun, the normal stuff for kids, uh, shooting guns, hunting, swimming, fishing, anything that was outdoors. Uh, I played basketball in high school. So uh, I was just anything athletic, really. I was a four, almost a 4 0 student. Um, I took every I took every AP course my high school offered except for one. It was just, it was easy. I was busy all the time, but I enjoyed it. I never had to study. Uh, I, I liked high school. It was, it was fun. Uh, I had a lot of group, friends in different social groups. Uh, I made the most of it. It was a good time. Uh, I, came, I think I came out of high school with like 18 hours because of all the AP courses. So uh, not going to college straight out of high school, I mean, it was kind of silly not to. Uh, I went straight into college after that. I was always interested in the military. It wasn't something I talked about a lot. Um, personally, I, I, I consider myself first generation military just because no one in my immediate family ever had any direct effect on me. My grandfather, uh, my dad's father, he served in World War II, uh, but he passed away before I was born. and. Um, Somewhere in our house, he, we, my dad had his canteen cup and it had um, just scrawlings of all the places he'd been in Europe. And I would always look at it and take it down and ask my dad questions about it or just different things like that. Um, and then I had a great uncle that was in a death march, one of the death marches. Uh, he was a Pacific POW. And I heard, I heard stories about him from my grandmother and great grandmother. So I, I didn't talk about it a lot, but I guess the, uh, the pride in our military was instilled in me. Um, in my childhood. And then when 9-11 happened, um, I mean, I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I, I can't really remember how it made me feel. I know I was angry. Um, I can't say that I, immediately I wanted to join the military and go off and fight, but uh, it definitely, uh, it, it was definitely a factor later in life when I, when I had the opportunity to join the military. So when did you uh, when did you finally make the decision? Um, it was around right around Thanksgiving of my freshman year in college. I'd considered it in high school, um, but like I said, I had a lot of college credits already. Um, I needed I wanted to go to college. Um, I don't think my parents they weren't happy when I joined the military in the beginning anyway. And if I had done it straight out of high school, I, <laughs> it would have been a big mess. Um, but it. I can't remember exactly. I, my roommate at the time, um, he had joined the Marines a few weeks before, and it kind of got me thinking about it, and it became all I was thinking about, and I was just constantly doing research. Um, I didn't talk to a recruiter before. I didn't want to. I, um, I didn't want anyone else's opinion. I kind of talked to people in the Marines and gathered opinions um, just my own way, and then uh, I finally made the decision. Uh, it was a little bit... Before think I think it was like two days before Thanksgiving, uh, I called my parents. It was like 11:30 at night or something. They were asleep, and I just had to tell them at the time. And uh, I, they were just pump the brakes, just slow down. Uh, oh, you're saying this was in 2004? Yeah, yeah, this was in 2004. And you were a freshman in the UK. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, they. I was on the phone with them. It was late at night. They were asleep. I kind of blindsided them. They didn't know what was going on. They were just calm down, calm down. So I came home over the Thanksgiving break, um, just explained to them and talked it out with them. And then uh, December 4th, 2004, I uh, went to MEPS and enlisted uh, in Louisville. I guess the main hurdle for me in boot camp, I guess uh, probably a month before finishing, I, some, I don't remember how I did it. Uh, I broke the, um, the second largest toe on my left foot and I didn't let any of the drill instructors know because I knew that if they found out, I was going to get dropped, and that would just keep my time in Paris Island longer, and it would be miserable. And uh, the quickest way off Paris, I heard this so many times from former Marines, that the quickest way off Paris Island is to graduate. If you get hurt or you're not in shape, you're just going to get stuck there longer, and it's just going to be a, a hard time. Um, so I broke my toe, and... Um, I just kind of dealt with it at night, like trying to elevate it or just 
keep it, stay off it the best I could, but that's not really easy to do when you're running 100 miles an hour in boot camp. Um, so I, uh, I, I ran our final physical fitness test on the broken toe and everything and uh, did very well. And I didn't know when I, like, when I was actually gonna have to tell the drill instructors because it was getting kind of bad. And then we did the Crucible, which is the final test in boot camp for the Marine Corps. It's, I, guess, I think it's 52, 50 some hours of just, you don't sleep, you don't eat, you just march around Paris Island and uh, perform a variety of tasks just tactical tasks, uh, intellectual tasks, all kinds of things. And uh, it finished, finishes off, I think it's like 40 miles total hiking or somewhere around there. And it finishes off with a 10 mile hike back to uh, your barracks. And I remember when we got back to the barracks, we stripped down and uh, went and showered and everything. And we were supposed to go back to breakfast, but my foot was so swollen, by that time I couldn't get it back into my boot. And a drill instructor saw it. so. I went straight to medical and uh, they made a big ordeal out of it, but the thing was that I'd passed the crucible, so technically I'd passed the final test and I would still get to graduate on time. The only kicker was that I would have to come back to Paris Island after my 10 days leave to get checked out by Paris Island Medical um, before going on through the rest of my training. Uh, so that was a, a setback in my career and I, I wasn't really ready for it. I didn't want to go back to Paris Island at all. Um, once I was out of there, I wanted to leave for good, but I found myself back there 10 days later. Let's see why you'd remember that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what was your, uh, what was your occupation? Uh, military police. Uh, and you get to choose that? Um, well, it, I did choose it, but it was kind of chosen for me also. I, I was a reservist here in Lexington with the military police company Alpha. So I knew that I wanted to be a reservist because finishing college um, has always been if Marine Corps was priority one, finishing college was priority 1A, um, I really wanted to finish. So I felt that being in the reserves would give me the best opportunity to, that, to do that. Um, so I guess now I'm wrong because I'm still in college six years later and I'm out of the Marine Corps, but um, I did get to, get to do college around the, along the way. Um, but the military police company was in Lexington um, where I was already going to school. It was just a perfect fit. And uh, I remember talking, when I actually did go to the recruiter just to tell him that I wanted to sign up, uh, I told him that I wanted to be a reservist and I wanted to know what options were around here. And I, I know there was a communications company in Cincinnati that had an opening and I didn't want to mess with radios. There was a supply opening in Fort Knox and I didn't want to do that. And uh, I went to the military police company and they kind of told me what they do. They're it's a field, field military police, so they don't do any of the police work. They're just uh, basically, um, for lack of better, uh, mechanized infantry, um, they just drive around in trucks, uh, whereas infantry would be on foot all the time. And uh, that just seemed right in line with what I was looking for. I really lucked out that it was right here in Lexington. Uh, the mobilization was supposed to happen in November, and we found out uh, probably March so time frame. Clear. November 2007 is going to be the mobilization. And uh, we found out in probably March of 2007 that we were going, or at least that a detachment was going to go. And since um, in the reserves, if you haven't gone on deployment and there is a spot for you, you're 99% sure you're going. Uh, so uh, there was a lot, there was 40 or 50 of us that hadn't gone at the time. So we kind of knew from that point and we went ahead and the company went ahead and broke us off into our own group so we could start training with each other. Um, so we knew a good six months ahead of time that we were going to be going to Iraq. Uh, we didn't know our job, so we had a broad training base. We had to train on everything. Um, yeah, so we had about six months. Um, so it was plenty of time to get our affairs in order and start preparing ourselves. So what was your initial reaction when you heard the news? And you knew it was coming. But I knew it was coming. Um, I kind of, I, I was excited. I'm not going to act. I was really excited because uh, I, by that time I'd been at the reserve unit for two years um, and it was really unusual for our unit not to have a deployment for that long because we'd gone in the first three years of the war and then um, to have that long of a break was kind of odd and um, I was excited. Um, I was ready to put to use what I'd learned and uh, I was just excited. Uh, my family, I can't say they were, they weren't excited at all. Um, I kind of broke it to them slowly. 
um, just kind of hinting that it might happen. And I think my parents especially, I, I guess they read the news and they knew that I'd been lucky up to that point not to get deployed. And um, I, they weren't surprised at all with the Iraq deployment. And then um, at that time I had started dating um, who, a girl is it, who's eventually became a wife. And uh, she took it pretty hard. She, um, yeah, she had a hard time with it. Was she, I mean, had she been familiarized with the, the military atmosphere prior to this? A little bit. Um, we'd been dating about a year and a half. Um, so she knew a little bit about it, but uh, her family is very patriotic and um, it, was, it was very easy for them to be supportive of me. But relationship-wise, it was very difficult on her. A numer numerous tasks, but our main one was um, supporting the Iraqi police and Iraqi army on the Syri Sir Syrian border. Um, they were in charge of just controlling who came in and, in and out um, through the port there. And um, specifically, we use the uh, biomet a biometric system to scan irises for uh, everyone going in and out of the border just to um, keep track of who is coming in and coming and going. And then we also had about 25 miles of border that we weren't sp specifically in charge of, but we were told to patrol and just maintain a presence on. Luckily, in our platoon that we mobilized with, we had um, a Vanderbilt student who was a major in Arabic, and he was very fluent in Arabic. And then we had another student that was um, from the University of Louisville, and he had taken two years of Arabic. And uh, they were very instrumental in preparing our platoon for dealing with the Iraqi people. Uh, just. I'd say 90% of the platoon picked up quite a bit of language from uh, useful language that we would use every day when we were there amongst the people. And then just the customs was the main thing, just how to treat people. And it, it really benefited our mission success. Just we weren't offending people constantly. We, uh, we could talk to them. It, it, it really benefited us. There was one funny story. Um, we were working the port for security for the, uh, the BATS team. The, this guy scanning the eyes and this um, they would come through on tour buses because I guess that's the most efficient way to travel over there just because it's cheaper and they load massive amount of stuff on these tour buses and just travel all over the place and this tour bus was coming in from Syria and um, this kid and um, this kid he's really pale he's white he looks American we weren't sure at the time when he got off and we were kind of suspicious and um, my buddy that I was working with was working on that side. He was working on the incoming to Iraq and I was on the outcoming and I didn't see him. Um, my buddy um, saw him and called him over and tried to talk to him and we figured out he was American and he was, an Amer he was wearing Duke basketball shorts and I think a Florida shirt. And he was a Florida National Guardsman that I guess he, was on, he said he was on vacation and he wanted to see Iraq. And it was one of the more bizarre stories I've ever heard. He had his dog tags on and everything. And we were just, we were like, you can't keep going. And we, could, we tried to explain it to him and try to explain it to him. And um, the bus driver was really begging for him to come back on. And we knew something was suspicious. Like the bus driver was like, he's coming with me. He's coming with me. And we're like, no, he's not. And uh, so we detained him and we actually called the State Department and they were really mad about it and they flew out a helicopter and took him back. It was just a funny story that I guess my, my buddy, you probably, that National Guardsman should probably thank him for saving his life or something. I, it was a, a dangerous situation for that guy just because I, I don't know what he was thinking going with dog tags and everything into <laughs> enemy territory. It was, it was funny at the, after it happened, but at the time we were kind of confused by it. Most people, when they got back from deployment, um, transitioned pretty well. And uh, we stayed, we were able to stay on active duty at our reserve unit for a few months. And it really helped because we were all pretty good friends. And uh, so we would just hang out and drink and just go to concerts to get just a kind of a, uh, a, trans a good transition phase for us. 
um, just getting to spend that time together um, in America. What was what are your thoughts on the on the Iraqi people and the progress being made at the time you left? Um, I thought a lot of pro progress had been made, but like I say, I I was in a very very small segment of Iraq. Um, within I, uh, probably a 10 square, square mile area. So my experience is pretty limited. Um, the people there were very supportive of us. Um, most of the people coming in and out of the, uh, the border were very supportive of us. Um, we even saw American or Iraqis that had immigrated to America during the war. They were finally, they were coming back. We saw a lot of that. And to that, that to me was a sign that some, we had done something right in Iraq, um, if Iraqi immigrants were fi were coming back to the country, um, the Iraqi people, like I said, were very supportive, friendly. Um, we never had any problems with um, them being unfriendly in any way. Um, I guess my personal experience on progress is pretty limited, like because I was in a that small area. Um, I would read a lot of the intelligence reports, and I knew that. Um, conflicts across the country were dropping and uh, it seemed like the war, uh, the conflict was over. It seemed like it was. We uh, we had heard rumors uh, around the unit that um, there was an Afghan deployment. It was the first, it would, been, it would be the first Afghan deployment our unit's ever been on. So uh, there was a lot of buzz, kind of excitement about who's going to go and who's not and everything. Um, and it got to be about February and um, February 2010 and that's when they finally came out with the list and um, my name was on it. I think there were 30 something of us coming from my reserve unit. Um, I was pretty, I don't know, kind of excited, so, um, kind of aggravated, I don't know. Um, I wanted to finish school, but at the same time, I knew by looking at the list, I was one of the more senior guys going, and I, I felt a strong responsibility to a lot of the younger guys um, that were going, just because um, I felt like I had a lot of experience uh, that I could give them, and uh, I knew that it wasn't going to be the easy deployment that the Iraq deployment was, and uh, leadership was going to be a uh, kind of lacking from um, from what I saw from the list. So I didn't try to fight it. Um, I, it's possible that I could have gotten out of it, but um, I I didn't. It I just rolled with it. I I wanted I actually wanted to go. I guess for lack of leadership um, above me or something, I was. The day I was, or two days after I was promoted to sergeant, I was uh, then promoted, to, or my billet was moved up to platoon sergeant. So in a span of two weeks, I've gone from being in charge of three guys to 39 guys. It was a huge, huge step for me, and it took, during the workup, it was very difficult on me, just uh, I wasn't prepared. Um, and I didn't really want, to, I didn't really want to be a platoon sergeant. Um, I felt that I, I would rather be operating on like a squad level. That way I could still be with the guys and in charge of patrols and everything. But I didn't, again, I didn't fight it because I saw the other choices and I kind of talked to a few of my friends who were also like high, uh, experienced corporals and sergeants. And we knew that if I didn't do it, then the, the alternatives weren't gonna be very good. And it was really difficult on me. It was the most stressful three months of my life trying to get a platoon ready to go out of Afghanistan. I just, I'd never uh, imagined that I would be in that position and I wasn't prepared. But um, it all turned out well and, it, and I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot about leadership and um, it was a good life experience for me. None of us had ever been on an Air Force base, so we weren't, we weren't sure what to expect, but it was, uh, I guess, tremendously more luxurious than what uh, the accommodations we were used to in the Marine Corps. Uh, I guess they had, they had candy bars at the chow hall and free massages and everything and all my guys just went crazy and it was 
hard time. Like, I get, they served alcohol. None of the Marines weren't allowed to drink it, but they had a bar there, and everyone was just amazed that the living uh, accommodations afforded to the Air Force. And and I, I, I'm kind of glad it happened um, that way just because it kind of took everyone's mind off of, uh, I'm going to be in Afghanistan for seven months and um, kind of lowered the stress level a little bit. Uh, we were there for three or four days. We had uh, just a few classes and um, just some logistics to work out. And um, September 20th, 2010, um, we got a flight into Camp Leatherneck, which is in the Helmand province of Afghanistan. Um, flew in in the morning, got there about noon. Um, about the same climate as Iraq. We were, it's, it's a desert down there, so it was warm, um, dusty, miserable. Um, I was a lot more nervous going to Afghanistan. Um, I just know I had friends that um, had been there and they didn't, they had a tough time and I had friends that had been injured there and uh, I just knew the uh, fighting climate was a lot different than uh, the last trip that I took overseas. We did security for the uh, the logistics transport guys, just the truck drivers and everything. We did security for them um, anytime they went outside the wire. Um, our second job was uh, immediate response team. So anywhere almost within, I would want to say 80 or 70 or 80 miles uh, circle of us, um, any trouble they had, whether they, uh, they had an IED and they couldn't recover themselves so they couldn't get back to base or if they got stuck in the mud and they just could not get out um, we were tasked to uh, have a, a group on standby it's kind of the, the same mission that we had for QRF quick reaction force just in the Afghan theater it was called IRT immediate um, response team and uh, so we would have a team on standby 24 hours a day uh, ready to go out and be outside the gate within an hour on the way to uh, help fellow uh, Americans in need. So uh, our first mission that my, uh, my squ well, my platoon squad, whatever you want to call it, is tasked with at the time, uh, we referred to as uh, the seed run. Um, there was a, it came down from the general level that um, we're doing the seed exchange program. So up north where they grow opium and the poppies, um, the mil our military was going to exchange their opium seeds on a, I guess, a two-for-one basis with uh, wheat seeds to try to transition the farmers to growing wheat instead of opium. So our mission was, well, to add on to that, um, we didn't, all the military transport vehicles that were capable of transporting seed were tasked out to as they should be to carrying food, water, uh, ammunition, the basic necessities to the infantry. So in country we didn't have, in Afghanistan, the Marine Corps didn't have enough transport vehicles to, to support this mission. So it was deemed that um, we would contract Afghan drivers to drive these transport trucks um, and we would provide security for them. Um, none of the trucks were made after 1970. Uh, a lot of them had road tires on them and we never, we didn't drive on the road at all. It was all off-road. Um, there was a language barrier. We were given one interpreter. Um, it was just a difficult, it was a difficult enough mission for anyone. Uh, especially for our first mission and especially with the uh, the replacement that we had gotten uh, there are the, the tra replacement training that we had gotten we weren't prepared um, we'd done our best um, but we, we just weren't prepared so um, we left uh, at midnight on October 2nd that's something about um, the the Afghan environment your center traveling off-road the max speed we would ever reach was probably 10 or 15 miles an hour. So a destination's 80 miles away, it's gonna take 12 hours. So 
we had to it, 12 hours on a good day. So we left uh, at midnight hoping to be there by that night. Um, so we connect with the, uh, the Afghan uh, seed truck drivers outside the wire and uh, we start moving and right away we realize that the trucks are in t their trucks are in terrible condition. We have two flat tires before we're five miles away. So, and they refuse to let us help them, uh, I guess out of an Afghan pride thing. And uh, they changed their own tires, which took probably six hours. So we've gone five miles and uh, we're six hours behind already. So we finally pick up some momentum uh, later in the day. Uh, it's daylight now. Um, we're all tired because we couldn't sleep because we're all too uh, pumped up to go on the mission. Um, anxious um, and um, we couldn't sleep and we left at midnight so all of us have been up for at least 18 20 hours um, so we're all getting tired it's about noon um, for this convoy um, I was a security security element leader and um, we were I was in charge of basically navigation so I had my front two trucks and then I was the third truck so um, I was really blessed to have really good Marines and they were awesome at what they did. So I did, all I did basically was just uh, help them out with navigation the best we could. And we just tried to pick a route that would get us there um, as quickly as possible. Um, we had, it was kind of a, a sink or swim um, method to us learning about Afghan tactics and everything. Uh, we didn't know a lot. We didn't know what we, as much as we thought we knew. And uh, so we started heading up. There were two main routes we could take. One, um, one put us closer to a, a tiny village that we knew was very uh, anti-American. And then the other um, kind of bridged up a hilltop. And uh, it was definitely safer as far as small arms go, but we had heard that um, the IEDs in that area were pretty heavy. Um, so the command decision from our convoy commander was that we were going the easy route to drive the uh the route that supposedly had ieds so we knew kind of we called it tabletop it was a hot spot um, it was kind of a plateau and uh, we knew that there were ieds there but it was our first convoy and we didn't know what to look for because in iraq you're driving on a road, you're looking for trash, you're looking for a rock that looks weird, wires or something. In Afghanistan, you're looking at dirt and they're buried and you don't know, the best you can hope for is maybe some di slightly different colored earth or disturbed earth that you maybe think's an IED and you try to steer away from it or um, sweep it with a mine detector and hopefully get a metal hit and then drive the other way. So we're up on this, plateau driving um, it's getting it's almost dusk now we're moving way too slowly and um, we tried to stop for the night or we didn't try to stop for the night we hadn't learned that traveling at night you just can't do it because you can't see what you're looking at and that's I mean too dangerous to uh, to proceed at night so we were traveling it was dusk and uh, me and the front three trucks and probably most of the convoy had, we were at the very end of the plateau where we thought the IEDs had ended. Like we thought we were home free and uh, a seed truck, an Afghan driver hits an IED. It, there were 44, 43 trucks in the convoy. And I think the 42nd truck hits an IED. So that was our first IED. Everyone just like, we weren't, we, that's the first time we heard the concussion, anything. We, everyone, didn't know what we we reacted well but it took like it took a few minutes where everyone was kind of panicked for a minute we didn't know what to do and then um, our lead truck our lead security vehicle called on the radio and said it was a seed truck he's okay he's out looking at it everyone's fine there's no injuries um, the only problem is we have to recover that vehicle now and it has a blown axle so um, they from somewhere, the Iraqis, uh, actually they didn't know. Sometimes the, uh, the uh, Afghans would just pull out 
spare axles from who knows where and fix their truck in a matter of minutes. In this case, he didn't have anything, but he still had tons and tons of seed. So I don't know, I don't want to get into too much of our uh, standard operating procedures, but we had to clear around that vehicle to, uh, in order so we could get on scene and uh, off or get the seed offloaded and recover that truck. And uh, as one of our, our lead or our rear truck is coming up, which is, uh, a, she was a female, she was a fire team leader in my team. She's driving up to it and she hits another IED. And uh, at that point, everyone, uh, I guess, uh, everyone kind of freaked out for a minute. And I, the bad part was I, was, I wasn't on scene. I was 43 trucks are spread out over two miles with the dispersion. So I, all I could hear was everything going on over the radio and everyone was kind of losing their mind back there. And uh, apparently it was, it was a pretty big one. It messed up her truck pretty bad. And uh, the doc, the corpsman, he gets back there and uh, we secure the area. We sweep it with mine detectors and we deem there's no IEDs there. And uh, we uh, get a corpsman back there and there was some class three concussions, which um, that means we have to fall them out. So we start clearing a, um, a landing zone for a helicopter on top of the plateau, which was a stupid, it was a terrible decision, but we didn't really have anywhere else to land the helicopter. Um, even though we knew there were probably IEDs there, we had to just drive around and clear it so the helicopter doesn't hit it. So we're doing this and miraculously, um, we cleared a, a probably, I don't know, a football field size area and there's no IEDs there. So we think we're good. We call in the, I call in the medevac and um, the bird's on its way. So the uh, guys from the back bring the injured Marines up and uh, they're getting ready to get on the bird. As they're coming up, they're traveling in a three vehicle stick. As they're coming up, um, the third vehicle hits an IED. So the rear vehicle, it's not the vehicle that any of the injured Marines were in, it was just a security vehicle. So that one hits an IED. Um, the bird comes and lands and um, we get the, the Marines evacuated and um, everyone's kind of taking a breath. And then we realize, well, we've got a bunch of sea trucks back there a mile back, we need to go get those. Um, we need to secure them for the night and we're not moving anymore tonight. But we still had a lot of logistics to work out so we probably weren't gonna get much sleep. So um, we send some trucks back um, to get those guys. And uh, we end up offloading the seed from that truck and putting it in, a, just spread, uh, spread loading it among the other trucks. And um, we deem that that truck's just not repairable. We can't fix the axle. So we light it on fire and torch it and just leave it in place. And uh, we have to recover the set our first vehicle, the first military vehicle that hit an IED. So uh, we take a tow truck back there and uh, pull it up and fix it and um, rig it for tow and pull it to the top of the plateau. So at this point, all our um, Afghan seed trucks are staged. They're solid. They're good. Um, they're staged for the night. And then we're pulling up our last, um, our vehicle that was destroyed by that first IED. And uh, the lead truck is coming right over the area where we slept for that helicopter earlier. We knew it was clear, or we thought we knew it was clear, and he hits an IED. And uh, at this point, it was so demoralizing because we thought uh, the, the three IEDs before that, we knew they, those were probably our fault. We shouldn't have been in those areas. We, we should have been um, practicing better track discipline. Um, like we could accept those because we hadn't driven in that area. I mean, that's, gonna, that's believable. There's an IED there, but an area that we had just cleared, we had another IED. Um, is so demoralizing and this one the uh 
the first three were all, they were big, but they were uh, uh, homemade explosives. So they were just, it was really concussive and uh, it was damaging, but it wasn't, I, it, I can't differentiate between, it wasn't as frightening as the fourth one. There was a fireball, um, we, we found shrapnel from it, so we figured out that it was an artillery shell. There was a huge fireball and um, that was probably 100 meters away from me. So I see it, hear it, but we can't get out of the vehicle because we don't know if there's IEDs between us. Uh, luckily, there's a vehicle that's right behind them, and uh, they run up there, and the guys are hurt pretty bad inside. One guy, um, pretty dislocated shoulder. He's uh, bleeding. We didn't know from where. And then another guy, he was in the turret, and he had broken his jaw. And um, they were good friends of mine. Um, one, I went to Iraq with one of the guys. Uh, I hung out with him on the weekends as a reservist. We're a lot closer than I do because we're with each other our entire six-year contract, and we live in the same area. We go to school together. We go to football and basketball games together. So I knew that his, this was his truck, and uh, they both had class three concussions. They weren't even conscious. So we immediately had, uh, got another medevac on the way, and uh, we got them out of there. Uh, but it, it was, like I said, so demoralizing that uh, we thought we'd cleared an area. Uh, we obviously hadn't. Uh, we hit an IED. We got three more people evacuated. Two of them were hurt pretty badly. And then uh, we're still left to sit out there at night in the desert. Um, the only good thing about the decision to go up there was that we, were at, we had the high ground and we weren't in danger of being attacked. That was the only good thing. Um, and it just so happened that the guy that got hit, uh, the last hit, he was my lead vehicle. So um, from then on, someone else was going to have to take the point and be the navigation, the uh, navigational man. So we try to regroup the next day. Uh, he hit the he hit the IED around probably two in the morning, and uh, we got him evacuated. And then finally, we were just no one gets out of their vehicles, no one moves. We're not doing anything. Um, luckily, our convoy commander, um, which it, this would differ throughout the deployment, whether it was an officer or a, uh, an enlisted person, but our convoy commander for this was a lieutenant, and uh, he had enough pool with, I guess, his rank to, uh, to argue with our uh, command, because they wanted us to keep pushing, and he, he was able to make the command decision on on the spot and just be like, we're not moving. And he kind of, I guess he kind of, equivalent of just hanging up the phone on him, didn't answer the radio and just, um, he kind of, it was a really good thing that he did. He saved a lot of us, or not saved a lot of us, but uh, could, could have saved a lot of us. Who knows what would have happened if we would have kept moving. So we kind of, so now we have two more vehicles, Marine Corps vehicles that are hit by IEDs. Um, one of them we think can run. One of them has lost a wheel or blown off an entire uh, left side of the rear axle. So it's not going anywhere. So we have to call in our our T team, the immediate response team that our guys are manning to come help us. But they hit three IEDs on the way up. Uh, and then they finally, but they were smaller, uh, just kind of uh, anti-personnel mines that don't do any damage to the vehicle. So they, uh, they make it up there and they're able to uh, help us and uh, secure some of the vehicles and take them back to base. Uh, that way we don't have as much of a, a load on us and if we have to uh, recover something else that um, we'll be able to do that without towing three trucks. Um, so we think we're ready to go. We still have to continue on and uh, get the seat up there because, uh, like I said, this mission came down from the general level. It was high priority. So uh, my second truck, he's ready to uh, take, he's going to be my lead man and I'm going to be in second position. But uh, the night before, we're setting up a, um, a cordon around the Afghans, um, mainly to make sure that they don't go anywhere and also just to provide better security. 
and uh, as he's moving to set up a cordon in another area that we thought was clear, he hits an IED. And uh, luckily, uh, it, it hit the mine roller on the front of his vehicle. Um, it, it damaged his vehicle, but everyone inside was fine, and uh, we were able to uh, get that vehicle towed pretty quickly. So my front two trucks are gone, so now it's left up to me, so I'm the lead truck now. Uh, easily the most nerve-wracking experience of my life. Um, we've hit six IEDs, nine if you include the guys that are on their way up to us. So we've hit nine IEDs in the past 48 hours, and now I have to drive as the front truck across the desert where hopefully I see an IED, but I'm probably not going to see it, and I'm probably going to get hit. So I just knew, I was 100% sure that, um, that I was going to get hit. And, uh, but we didn't have an option. We had to get the seat up there. It was a uh, mission priority. So we start moving and, um, everything goes well. Um, uh, we reach a small, uh, fire base, an artillery base. That's probably 15 clicks away with no incidents. Uh, I honestly, to this day, I don't know how it happened. The Afghan trucks didn't break down. Everything just went perfectly. Uh, we made it to the fire base, and uh, from there, um, we hooked up with uh, some route clearance guys, and uh, they just kind of pretty much paved the way for us up to uh, our destination up north uh, to a small fob where we uh, handed off the seed to the infantry and they distributed it. Um, <clears throat> like I said, to this day, I can't believe I didn't hit one then. Um, I just knew it was happening. Um, but. Uh, I, luck was on our side. It wasn't all luck. Um, we had learned a little bit in that short 48 hours. Um, a lot of tactics that uh, we wish we would have known probably a, a few weeks sooner, but uh, we learned a lot and uh, I was able to apply it and um, a lot of luck too, just uh, getting out of there. About a, two months after that, we uh, were doing a similar mission um, up north, and uh, that's when my truck hit an IED. Uh, I was in the third, I was third in line again, um, or third in order of the convoy. And it, yeah, it honestly, um, I think it was worse being close to an IED than rather than being on it. The trucks were so well built by this point in um, the Iraq and Afghan wars that it's a, sh it's a shame that they weren't available sooner. Uh, it could have saved so many lives. Um, I mean, my truck was completely destroyed, but everyone walked away um, with a little bit more than nausea and a headache. Um, uh, we were all very lucky to walk away, but like I said, um, by the end, IEDs were so commonplace, but we did get very adept at finding them. Um, Towards the end, we had a two-week mission where we found numerous IEDs, and I don't—I'm not sure that we, I don't think I don't remember hitting any. So, but that was another problem with the way I don't, the replacement system for the Marine Corps. As soon as we got good at doing it, we're out of the country, and we have a week to teach the guys that are replacing us to to find IEDs. When you hit an IED, it's um, you're automatically awarded combat action ribbon. And um, that was a bad experience that I had. Um, just, I guess the term is ribbon chasing, just going after awards just for the sake of having an award. And I felt like some of our guys were doing that. Um, it was almost a joke among some guys. It's like, I'm driving in the most, I'm gonna drive in the most dangerous spots. I'm gonna drive where I think there's IEDs because our unit, aside from that first trip no one got hurt and um, they it was sickening is what it was and uh, I'd, if I ever caught any of my guys talking about it it, uh, it wouldn't have been pretty very rarely did any um, Afghan forces try to uh, engage us closer than a thousand meters and uh, their weapons aren't effective at that range um, aside from the indirect fire. And so it was generally just pop shots. Um, 
Um, we fired back sometimes. Uh, midway through the deployment, our company uh, was reprimanded pretty heavily. Um, we were told our mission wasn't to engage the enemy, it was to um, deliver the logistics to the infantry, which was 100% correct. Um, it's just the instinct when you're getting shot at is to shoot back. And if the rules of engagement don't let you do that, it's very frustrating. Um, but that was the choice we had to make. And we were in extremely up armored vehicles and there wasn't any danger, but you still, if you're getting hit, you want to hit back. You don't want to sit there and just take it because you can. Um, so we saw quite a bit of that. And occasionally uh, we would have to drive near a city and we would take accurate fire and then we would return fire. But most of our engagements were uh, further than a thousand meters. It was a little harder for me just to uh, adapt from coming from such a serious environment uh, where your life's on the line every day to especially back to uh, Lexington where college is in session and there's parties and people just aren't thinking about it. Um, it took a little bit of time for me to adjust um, because of my position and in the leadership, I was a lot more serious over there than I am over here. And it took a while for me to loosen up and uh, just uh, realize the way I'm talking to people. I just, uh, I don't need to be so directive and I can't talk to everyone like they're Marines, they're uh, civilians, they're, I mean, it's just not necessary. So that took a little bit of adjustment, but um, overall my transition I think it all depends on the person you are. Um, I think 10 people can have the exact same experience and they're all gonna transition differently. And uh, for me, I didn't find it very difficult. I'm in a class with a lot of freshmen and it's just, uh, it's different. Everyone's talking about going to frat parties and sorority things and I, I don't know, it's, uh, I don't leave that life anymore and it I'm okay with it I prefer it this way it's just um, I think I'm a lot more driven to uh, to succeed in school than a lot of uh, the people in my classes just because I uh, I mean I've seen alter I've been through some alternatives I've been in the military and uh, I'd much rather I know that getting a college degree and doing what I want to do in college is uh, more important than, or not more important, but it's what I want to do. I know I'm in the right place, I guess. And a lot, I see a lot of them just like gaffing off or uh, not doing their homework and quizzes and stuff, and I just can't understand it. Um, I don't know. It's more serious for me now, finishing my degree. So I've actually had to transition back to school three separate times. Once when I got from training, once when I got back from Iraq, and this last time. And uh, the first time, it there just weren't resources out there. Um, the GI Bill, I was forced to find everything on my own. Uh, enrollment, I had to do all my on my own. I didn't know, there was no one to talk to. I mean, there was a VA representative, but there was no one to, uh, to assist with it. And it was kind of the same story when I got back from Iraq. Um, shortly after getting back from Iraq, um, I got involved with the UK MVA, the Military Veterans Association. And uh, I was treasurer for that, um, for that group. And I got, it was just good to get back and talking with the uh, other veterans. And it was just such a resource to have other people that have gone through the same things. And they may know a trick that you don't, or they may know a phone number that you don't. And uh, you can share with each other. And that's what the UK MVA did. And then the Veterans Resource Center at UK is just, it's amazing. Um, First, that those that it was difficult before because they they came in in six months. Tony Dotson he transformed it, and it was so easy coming back to school this time. I sent an email in um, <clears throat> when um, in March, I guess, around the time priority registration for the fall was going to be. I sent an email to Tony, and 
that was actually still in Afghanistan. I sent an email to Tony and uh, I sent three emails total and I was registered for classes, re-enrolled, everything was taken care of and my GI Bill was ready for me. It was just amazing the, uh, the transformation in the past four or five years that the University of Kentucky has gone under uh, with regards to Veterans Affairs.